Hello, everybody, and welcome to Getting APIs to Work. Today, we say hello to Jose Aro Peralta. Hey, Jose, how are you doing? Hi, Eric. Thank you. I'm really excited. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here. So you're the founder of microapis.io and the author of Microservice APIs. And your, your activities and, and writing the book came out of your experience. And I think let's get started by talking a little bit about you know, what you work on and how those experiences during your work motivated you to write that book. Sure. So through microapis.io, I do a lot of consulting with uh, companies that are working with microservices and APIs. Um, companies from small companies to fast growing startups to big companies. and you know, over the years, I, uh, I've been helping these companies. I, I've encountered a, a number of recurring problems when, when it comes to building APIs and microservices. So the point of this book is to, to go through all of these problems and try to provide a one-stop guide for developers, architects, and engineering managers who have to, first of all, decide whether they, they should work with microservices and APIs or not, and if they're going to do it, what are the strategies and and approaches that work best for these for this approach? Mm -hmm. And I, I like the way how you called it the one stop guide. That's nice. Um, so, and and I, I mean it's interesting that you say you work with smaller and, and medium companies because I think sometimes these also feel like their need to deliver fast and build fast, right, is something where they cannot invest in maybe exploring technologies and these kind of things. And, and that's the, the part, let's talk about this a little bit, because I found that so interesting that you have kind of this maturity model of, you know, how companies kind of approach this idea of how do we actually develop software? So let's get started at the lowest level, so to speak. What was the pattern that you've seen that where you would say that really isn't maybe all that great? So the, the lowest level when it comes to building API integrations is what we could call the, the server first approach. The idea is we build the server first and we build the client later. And the reasoning behind this is because we don't know what the server, the API is going to look like until you build it. So you need to build it first and then build the client. I, I would say this is an approach that actually goes back to the early days of building APIs when we were not sure what the documentation formats are, what the protocol looks like, and and to kind of avoid problems, people would typically take this approach. But surprisingly, this is still very common among many API development teams. Mm -hmm. I would, I mean, from what I see, sometimes I would say that like there are two fundamental problems with that, right? One is speed. <laughs> so this this serializes things in a way that is unfortunate. And the other thing, which I, I think is the even bigger problem nowadays, is that it has this built-in assumption that once you're done with programming the server, um, you're done with programming the server, right? And you will not change it anymore. And I think that's like where then you actually start, even if you try to do it, where you start seeing problems, I would guess. Exactly, because to be honest, I like really, we, we build APIs for our clients, right? We don't build APIs as, as an API developer, you don't build it for yourself. You're, you're using the API to expose the capabilities of your server, of your services. But really, you're trying to make these APIs useful for your clients. And I think that you will not be in a, in a complete state in terms of API design until you understand the requirements, until you fully understand the requirements of your client. And that's not going to happen by building the server first. If you follow that approach, Into, what... Yeah. Yeah, what usually in, happens into, into the void, right? <laughs> exactly. Like, Let's build it. <laughs> so yeah. what, what's going to happen is you deliver that API, and as the client starts working out that integration, they are going to discover new needs, missing features. You're going to have to go back to the server, add those things in, release again, and that's when you end up with a mis with a communication problem. Like, at what point do you know that the API is doing what what it has to do, and the client is expecting the right thing as well? Mm -hmm. But so so for the first approach, I would say, okay, it's pretty clear that it's probably not, not such a great thing. But then like the next step that you're looking at is better. Um, it's an improvement over that approach, but maybe still not quite what you would want to aim for eventually. But let's first talk about that next step. So so the next step when you try to you know get a little bit better along that maturity 
development, so to speak. What would the next step look like? So the next step is when there's an element of API design in the process. So the client development team sits together with the backend development team and they discuss the needs of the API. But at this stage, it's, it's a very common situation in many, in many companies. There is no desire, at, let's put it that way, there's no desire to embrace a formal process to document the, the API, to, to describe the design. So mm -hmm. what a lot of companies or a lot of teams do is they, they settle on JSON examples. Mm -hmm. So we, we want to know what the API is going to look like. We decide that on the basis of JSON examples. We produce them. And then the client development way go, uh, team goes, goes one way to work on the examples and what the client needs to do. The, develop, the back and develop the, the development team goes their own way. The good thing is they can work in parallel. But the problem is also examples only go that so far in terms of describing an API, they are, they are open to interpretation. So a date, for example, is a string, but it's also, it, it, has, a, it has a specific format. So how do you enforce that, right? Yeah, and I think in particular, if your workloads, if your services get a little bit more complex and you have, you know, variations and you also maybe have multiple clients where, you know, for some clients, uh, they, they have kind of different examples they work from because that's what interests them, right? And I think then you get into this uh, problem, like you said, that examples can only take you so far and, and that's probably not going to work yeah. great, but it's it's better. Yeah, I, th I think especially when the, when the examples are gonna get complex and you're gonna have optional properties or maybe conditional properties, <laughs> that you need multiple examples to describe that. And at some point mm -hmm. they become cumbersome. I think also the problem is as the examples change, as the API changes, you need to change all the examples. And usually that doesn't happen very, very well. So you, you may end up having legacy examples that don't actually represent the ultimate state of the API and they are very misleading. That actually would be interesting to check out. You know, if you have these kind of approaches of, well, here are some examples to see, are these really current? Yeah. <laughs> or how many of these? <laughs> okay. So, so what we see then is that the example-based approach is better because at least you have a conversation, like you said. So you talk a little bit about, I would say you're going in the direction of API first, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of a, yeah, like a proto um API. Well, it's 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 kind of a first version of an API, but but then you get to those problems. So, what's the next step then that will avoid those problems and get you to the next level? So, so what you really want to have is a is an approach in which both the client development team and the backend development team have a very explicit understanding of what the API has to do, and also be able to validate your implementation against that design and mm -hmm. obviously you can i'm sure you can use different tools but the best thing is to leverage the the biggest ecosystems in terms of api design and and documentation so if you're working with rest apis although there are different documentation formats the best thing you can do is really go with open api because there are so many tools around open api they're just going to make your life easier and the same with graphql you know design your your APFS following the schema definition language, you're going to be able to leverage that documentation in your development process, not only to implement your clients and your in your service correctly, but also to validate that implementation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that really is one of the almost most important points to say that if, if you then settle on like this well-known specification format, not only are you able to use more tools, but also like if new tools come along, you can just use them, right? There's basically nothing you have to do. All, is, all you have to do is get the new tool, feed your specification into it, and then you, you get whatever that tool promises. It exactly. Will be doing. Exactly. Because it, it's the biggest community. So there's always going to yeah. be new tooling coming within this ecosystem of tools and, and the community is huge. If you have any questions around open API, you, you can tap into this enormous and, and brilliant community. So I'm wondering, you know, just in terms of the the journey, so to speak, of companies, you know, going along this maturity um, line, like, like you said, like for some, they might be um, not yet at this level of really doing contract driven API first, so to speak. 
And they might think we can't invest into this because, well, we would need to upskill people, learn things, learn tools and stuff. On the other hand, I would say, but of course I'm biased, that this investment will, will pay back very quickly because you, you can develop faster, more reliable, right? So your tombs actually get more confident. So they are more likely to, to be able to, more likely to be willing to make changes because they have more confidence in, in what they're building. So I would say that the payback should be very quick, but I'm, I'm just wondering from your experience, do you see a lot of hesitation or do you see a lot of companies saying, okay, we, we don't really want to do it, but probably it's worth it. Like, what have you seen in terms of people? I think doing? what I think it's a, it's a big trade off for certain types of companies, especially for, for those startups that are fast growing and they need to do things very fast. So they don't have, in many cases, the time to spend on training and upskilling the developers or providing a lot of guidance because everybody's very busy doing a lot of things and, and those things have to happen very fast. So what I, what I see in many I'm of those... <laughs> I'm just wondering how many of these things are actually fixing stuff because they broke something. As, as well, as well. So, <laughs> so it, it happened to me on one occasion, actually. The, there was this, um, I was working with a client and they were building this API integration. And, and they, were, they, they were having this uh, API first approach, but using JSON examples. And the problem was that communication was getting messy between the client and the, and the backend development team. And especially having this situation in which the server can't release un undetected changes, that, to put it that way. You know, so it's easy to tweak the code and accidentally change the, API, the way the API works if you can't validate that. Mm -hmm. So we actually, I, th I think with this approach, especially when the api is getting complex if if you don't take a step back it's easy to end up in a situation in which progress is very difficult yes because you're constantly releasing integration errors so i think what is useful in these cases is at least or necessary also in some situations take a step back consolidate your design in a specific in a specification formats and move forward driving changes from mm -hmm. the specification but, you know, I, I really, I would be interested to find out about like the balance. So you said, yes, you, you know, you like releasing, you might actually break things, right? So you're, that costs you in terms of effort to fix things and stuff. But I'm also really wondering like how much this affects kind of the, the culture, you know, inside that at some point teams will just become very hesitant to, to just change things because they, they're not really trusting their own process so much, right? And then I think that's a cost that's it's really hard to quantify, but I think that's a real cost that that you will have. Well, it's a real cost because at some point changing the product is very difficult. Because yes. if you are not, if you can't rely your, if you can't rely on your process to deliver API changes, then it's very difficult to continue improving the product. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a real cost for for those companies if they if they can't adopt a, a different approach to to managing these changes and uh, mm -hmm. i think always introducing the this this kind of specification driven development you know where you have the specification and you drive changes from the specification and you validate your your server and your client from the specification i think unless you can use that approach you're always going to have this element of uncertainty in your in your apis mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. Okay, so now let's uh, jump in briefly uh, into your book because I think we now definitely have kind of driven home the fact that you probably should think about that. And then you wrote this book where, like you said, it's this one-stop shop where it should guide developers how to do that. So please give us a brief rundown on how you do that in your book. Sure. So the the so in the book i introduced this idea of documentation driven development and so we mentioned before specification driven development and i was what i mean is something similar something like that right the idea is that the way i describe it is you should have a stage first to to discuss the requirements of the api then design those produce a design based on that and then consolidate that design in a specification and then implement against that specification 
and then use the specification to validate your implementation. And the crucial mm -hmm. thing is that no, no release goes ahead unless it complies with the specification. That mm -hmm. ensures that neither the client nor the server are going to break the integration. Mm -hmm. So, so this is the pro this is the the process that I try to advocate in the book, and then the rest of the book is, especially designed for those developers who are, so to say, working in the trenches. You know, so the the company has decided we are going to work with microservices and APIs, but like I say, in many of the in many cases there is not a lot of guidance as to how we're going to do it. You're a developer and you're given the task of building this service mm -hmm. with a REST API and you have to figure out the testing strategy, authorization, documentation, and so on. So uh, so the, the idea of the book is to cover all these all these grounds. So you're going to learn to mm -hmm. design the API, to document it, implement it based on the specification, testing strategies, authorization, and deployments. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a good I would I would say it, to me it looks like a very good kind of introduction into how to make a development process faster and more reliable I would say yes yeah. yeah that that's okay. that's on the on the on the background always in the book and mm -hmm, always mm -hmm. choosing fra development frameworks that can leverage the documentation in some way so for example when you mm -hmm. have if you have a specification in rest or graphql you don't need to write all your validation models by hand. You can leverage the specification to automatically apply validation to your payloads. You know, that's something you mm -hmm. don't need to do anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you also talk about like tools you can use, like testing tools and fuzzing tools and these kind of things. And I, I think that's like what, like we already discussed, right? That's one of the beauties of this approach that the more tools the community produces, you can just use them and you know, it's not it, it's not going to be like such a big effort. Of course, you have to learn how they work and stuff. But. Exactly, but that's uh, that's the that's the challenge. I think that for companies to invest in this learn in, in this learning and, and upskilling, but I think it's very important. I think the 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 dividend you get out of it is is far off surpasses yeah. the the cost of the investment, and. Yeah. If you don't have the time to do it, then my book at least serves as a guide for those developers who are <laughs> who may be lost in the process. Okay, very good. I think that's a wonderful closing statement. Um, thank you, Jose, for joining. It was a lot of fun talking to you. Thank you so much, Eric. Really enjoyed. Okay, and I'll encourage everybody, of course, to check out the book, to check out the other resources. We'll link everything from the description down below. And with that, we're done for today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. And until next time, keep getting APIs to work. Bye. Thank you. Bye.